Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. I'm so glad you're with us wherever you're joining us. If you're joining us on the TV airwaves here in Santa Barbara, California, we welcome you at TVSB. And of course, so many of you join us from all over the world at goodlifetelevision.org and our YouTube channel and the Good Life Conversations podcast. Uh, so wherever you're joining us from, we're grateful you're with us. We're talking about the good stuff. We, If you go to goodlifetelevision.org or the YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of great people. Uh, we've had all walks of life represented in these first few years, and uh, and it's been such an exciting journey. And uh, today we have an executive with us. We have a builder, uh, and I'm so excited about Michael Solomon joining me. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Yeah, we, you know, I'll give you a quick uh, introduction to kind of Michael's history and background. It's, it's, he's a, uh, uh, very accomplished executive. He's the founder of Truly a Media, among other things, but he's been an entertainment executive uh, for decades. Uh, he's a philanthropist. Um, uh, he, he has uh, been involved with organizations specifically benefiting education, public health, and the arts. We're going to get into that a little bit, but for Michael's career has, has spanned decades, and I want to kind of get into that. I love you know, we've had a few kind of entrepreneurial executives uh, on the program over over the course of time, and it's always uh, a great opportunity. I love talking with with uh, folks. So, so Michael, first of all, just before we get into kind of your vision and career and kind of what's happened, what tell us a little bit about kind of your upbringing, where you came from. I was uh, born in New York City, New York which means I am a true New Yorker because I was born and raised in Manhattan, not the Bronx and uh, not, uh, <laughs> not Staten Island or Queens. And uh, my uh, uh, father's uh, uh, father, my grandfather was born in Berlin, Germany, but he was six months old when he came uh, to the US. And my mother, my mother's father was born in New York City uh, proper. So uh, I guess I'm a third and fourth generation New Yorker. Wow. And what was it like? What was that like? For, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, place to be born and raised. Well, I didn't know anything else but that. So uh, I was, uh, you know, raised on the streets of New York City and uh, schooling in uh, New York City. And uh, I am, uh, uh, I guess, uh, being raised on the city of, uh, of New York, it uh, prepared me uh, for a lot of life's difficulties and challenges because as the song goes, you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Right, and, uh, right. And I believe I made it in New York, which pretty much uh, I've made it uh, anywhere. And I right. think- that education and growing up on the streets of New York really prepared me for life in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And did you, so what was your road in terms of coming through school, finishing school, and then deciding on kind of media entertainment? How, how did that all happen? Well, I went to uh, school in Boston, uh, which is called Emerson College, and uh, Emerson is one of the great communications and media schools in the in uh, in the universe. And uh, uh, half halfway through my uh, freshman year, I joined the army because they had a six month program at that in those years, and uh, I spent. Uh, half of my sophomore year in the army and uh, field artillery and became a, a, a teacher in the 105 millimeter howitzer in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Then I went back to Emerson, finished my half of my sophomore year, or went to summer school and uh, finished the first half of my sophomore year. And then I found I was 19 years old at uh, completed two years of college and uh, and uh, my army uh, requirements. And then I decided to transfer to New York University. And uh, I started out uh, uh, going to uh, the Evening School of Commerce, which was now called the Stern School of Business uh, at New York University. And I worked for a company called United Artists when I was uh, eight, 18 years old and my first job was loading films on trucks. 
And when I went for the job, they said, no, you wouldn't want this. I said, why not? Well, it only pays $38 a week. I said, uh, yeah, but I'll take it. I said, why would you do that? I said, because it gets my foot in the door. And, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't grow uh, unless you have your foot in the door. So uh, I grabbed uh, the opportunity. I didn't care about the $38 a week. And uh, then I went to evening school uh, commerce while working for United Artists. And uh, coincidentally, uh, many years later, I was elected to the board of the Stern School of Business. And I was on the board uh, for 38 years, uh, actually 33 years, sorry. 33 years I was on the board of the Stern School of Business. And uh, so um, that pretty much uh, was my uh, education and, and uh, and I'm currently on the board of Emerson College uh, as well in Boston, where my grandson goes. So uh, oh, wow. I'm very involved in higher education and I mentor a lot of kids uh, in, uh, in college and I get a kick out of it. It's sort of uh, giving back. So, yeah, oh, that's yeah. so great. I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to give back uh, to uh, young people. Yeah, and I want to get into that more in a second. So, so after you, so you spent eight years at United Artists, and then you were hired. My understanding is to create a Latin American TV division uh, for MCA, which is now NBC Universal. Talk about that transition and kind of where where that took your career. Well, I was uh, uh, loading films on trucks, as I said, and uh, I guess they thought I was the best loader of films on trucks I ever saw. <laughs> uh, so uh, from there, they asked me to go in the international division. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, you'd be marketing our content outside the United States. And then they asked, uh, have you ever been outside the United States? I said, yeah, I think my father once took me to Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> I said, I think that's as far outside the United States I had ever been. <laughs> so the first place they sent me to was Panama. I was uh, just turning, uh, this was in 1980, and I was just turning 21 years of age. And my mandate was to open up the Central American territory to American movies. So I traveled to Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Salvador, Costa Rica, and Panama. I was 21. What did I know? And, wow and uh, lived in Panama. And then a year later, they, I guess I did a good job because they transferred me to Bogota, Colombia. And I lived in Colombia for a year. And that was quite an adventure because I traveled all over the country and uh, it was pretty dangerous in those years. But you know, when you're that age, you sort of don't think about those kind of things. And I travel with the 38 on my side. Uh, if I didn't, yeah. I wouldn't be here talking to you now. And that's another story. After a year uh, traveling throughout Colombia, they made me manager of Peru and Bolivia. So I lived in Lima for two years. I was 26 years old. And uh, so I was eight years with United Artists and then a company called MCA came along. Uh, MCA was the largest company in the media business in those years. It's now owned by Comcast, Universal, NBC. And they asked me to start their Latin American television division. I said, sure. And they uh, moved me to, uh, uh, to Mexico. I opened their office in Mexico City and uh, eventually opened another office in, uh, in Brazil, in Rio and Sao Paulo. And I traveled throughout 16 uh, countries in Latin America and put most of the, kind of, uh, most of the television networks on the air in those, in those, uh, in those at that time, which is 90, early 60s. And, uh, I spent uh, what uh, I think uh, with MCA, eventually they brought me back to the US and gave me international responsibility. So I started to travel to Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, as well as Latin America. So uh, I really pioneered the uh, international marketplace for American content. And literally uh, probably uh, I was the largest distributor of American television content in the world for 40 years. And uh, between uh, United Artists, MCA, and then I started my own companies, which uh, you'll get into. Yeah, wow. Uh, that's the uh, 
the story of uh, the 60s and my uh, youth at, uh, in my 20s. That's what I did. You became the CEO in January of 1980 of Telepictures. So well, talk about kind of the, uh, the CEO. I mean, I founded it. I founded the company. Right, right. Uh, so uh, I left after 14 years with MCA. I became a, a vice president when I was 30, which was the youngest vice president in, the, in those years. Uh, I think it still holds a record. And uh, then uh, after 14 years, I decided I wanted to be in my own business because I'm an entrepreneur. And I thought 14 years with one company was enough. And I started a company called Telepictures. And I started in 1978. I founded it, became chairman and CEO. I brought it public uh, 14 months after I started it. So wow. It went public uh, uh, in January of uh, 19, uh, 1970 and uh, came on NASDAQ. And uh, we started syndication in the in the in, in the uh, the television industry uh, with a little series called People's Court, and uh, that uh, uh, became the godfather of all of the uh, court shows, which are probably ten of them now. Right. And, uh, still on the air after thirty eight years or something like that, and uh, so that's how Telepictures uh, started, and uh, we grew into one of the largest syndication companies uh, in the uh, United States. Uh, and uh, we bought uh, several uh, television stations. Uh, we had magazines, uh, we were in the home video business, et cetera. It was uh, uh, a company that uh, started out with, uh, I think $3 million when it went public. I think I raised $3 million. And uh, to make a long story short, 13 years later, sold it to Warner Brothers for uh, 1.4 billion. <laughs> so I always say that only in America is something. <laughs> like right, right. Wow. So, so, so January 1980 is Telepictures goes public, and then there was a there was a merger with Lorimar. Is that is that? Do well, I have that right? seven years later, uh, my company uh, bought a company called Lorimar. And it became Lorimar Telepictures. And Lorimar Telepictures is famous. We produced Dallas, uh, Falcon, right. Falcon Crest, Knott's Landing, and many of those type of shows. And uh, we also bought the old MGM Studios. And it was called uh, Lorimar Telepicture Studios in Culver City, which is now the Sony Studios. And that's a long story how it became Sony. But in any event, uh, you know, middle-class guy from New York City, all of a sudden, uh, uh, my company that I'm running uh, owns uh, one of the principal Hollywood studios uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the United States. So it was a wonderful time. It's, it's, just it's wonderful to go uh, to enter the gates and have the uh, guards salute you. <laughs> Incredible. All starting at $38 a week, loading $38 trucks. $38 a week, loading films on trucks. That's right. That is such a great story. So before we get in, uh, let's finish, let's kind of take us as to as current as we can. So you, you founded Truly uh, Media Group, which ended up, I think, being acquired by Chicken Soup for the Soul, if I have that right. That's so right. What was, what was your... What was the thought process, or why, well, I, why uh, truly? I uh, started a, a company that focused on faith, and uh, doesn't matter what what religion I am. I happen to be Jewish, uh, but I believe in faith, uh, no matter what religion. And uh, we, uh, my they, uh, and my team went around. This is an idea that I had. And uh, we went around to ministries all over the country and we signed up uh, the, uh, uh, the ministers, um, uh, what do you call it? The, every Sunday they give a talk. What do you call that? The, the sermon? Uh, like sermons? Yeah, sermons. So uh, I signed up uh, hundreds of, uh, of ministers delivering their sermons on uh, Truly, which was a platform which you could do log into at truly.com. And uh, we uh, had uh, ministers delivering their sermons uh, for free all over the United States. The way I made money is I charged advertising. 
And, uh, and I, so I got what I wanted. The ministers got the, what they wanted because they wanted to spread their message to as wide a, uh, an audience as possible, which I allowed them to do. And so I uh, started also a Spanish language service uh, called Truly in Espanol and uh, signed up uh, many, many ministers in, in Spanish as well. So uh, it grew and grew. And then a company uh, called Chicken Soup uh, which was just starting out th at that time, uh, the CEO came to me and said, uh, I really want to be in the faith business and you're, uh, you've been so successful, I'd like to buy your company. I said, really? And he said, uh, yeah. So uh, long story short, I sold, uh, uh, I sold, chicken, I sold to Chicken Soup, uh, truly.com. And it's still uh, very much a part of the Chicken Soup uh, platforms. They own many, many platforms. And uh, still the same people that ran it for me are still running it, uh, which I'm happy to say. So I think that was uh, two, three years ago, maybe four years ago. So I'm very happy that it's, uh, it's living and it's doing extremely well. And it, again, it came from my imagination. So I was <laughs> uh, happy about that. And you're still advising Chicken Soup for the Soul, is that correct? I was uh, a year later, the CEO of Chicken Soup called me and said, I'd like you to, to join my company. I said, I'm not looking for a job. He said, no, 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 I'm not offering you a job. I said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to be senior advisor to our company. I said, what does that mean? That means uh, you'd be, you'd be uh, helping me grow the company. So I said, well, I'll do it on two conditions. Number one, I have no administrative uh, responsibilities. And number two, nobody reports to me. So uh, <laughs> he said, done deal. So I've been part of uh, Chicken Soup and I've really been very uh, involved in helping them grow. And it's uh, it, it's grown quite considerably if you've ever looked up Chicken Soup. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we've had we've it, had them on the program. Yeah, so... Uh, and uh, they own uh, Truly. So uh, I think that's how I got to you. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Mean, uh, Maureen, yeah. Maureen uh, introduced us, I believe, and she runs Truly. Yeah. Well, no, we love their platform and all the things that are going on uh, with, you know, obviously Truly being a big, big part. But so, so that is an incredible road. I don't know that I've talked to somebody uh, with them kind of more incredible journey here of from from $38 a week to you know going taking a company public in 14 months and then doing all the things you've done so what well, I'm kind actually, of I'm actually 102 years old <laughs> you look great you look great so, so so what what was the passion talk about kind of your passion because and then and then I, let me put it this way what is your um approach how do you take something from like a truly idea or telepictures or whatever we want to talk about but from from here's an idea to it happening like what is that road like and how would you you talk about mentoring i know you mentor young people but what do you how do you talk to somebody who's a who's got an idea or a vision or a dream but wants to see it actually happen well, I think everybody has a dream of one kind or another. But as I always use the analogy about producing a motion picture, you can produce a motion picture and you could have a great cast. You could have great writers. You could have a great director. But at the end of the day, the success is in the execution. And if it's not executed with all of that talent, et cetera, then it's going to fail. At the same time, you could have great execution without uh, well-known actors, without a well-known director. Many motion pictures have been successful because uh, of the execution and, uh, and the picture being turned out really well. So I believe that uh, you're only as successful as the people you surround yourself with. So uh, it's always the team of people that I surrounded myself that helped me execute my ideas successfully, because without those people, I never would have been able to, to, uh, uh, to be successful. And I always say, which sounds uh, a little uh, 
uh, patting on the back, which I don't mean it, it to sound that way, but I think I'm the smartest guy in the world, and uh, which is kind <laughs> of arrogant. And people will say, why is that? I said, because I know what I don't know. Right. And, uh, and I try to fill in the blanks with people who are smarter than I am in, in particular areas and creating a team and uh, combining all of the talents of the team to be successful. That's, I believe, uh, has led uh, uh, to, to, to the road of success for me is uh, believing in the people I've surrounded myself with. And a lot of those people have gone on uh, to great success, running networks, television studios, movie studios, uh, running big companies, et cetera. People who started with me as, with, uh, you know, as interns. Uh, and uh, I always believe in sharing. So when I went public, I gave people stock because I couldn't afford high salaries. So I said, if you want to take a leap with me, a leap of faith, I can't afford to pay you a lot of money because I don't have a lot of money, but I'll give you some stock. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, that stock made several, more than several of the people that started working with me millionaires. And uh, literally they bought their homes, raised their kids, sent their kids to college, et cetera, uh, because I gave them a piece of the action. Yeah, it's so great. Yeah. So what is, in terms of team, I mean, you, you've built and worked with lots of teams and grown teams. How do you, uh, how would you advise somebody who's in leadership in, in terms of building and growing a team that stays together and achieves the objective? Don't micromanage. Very, yeah. very important advice. Listen to your people, meet with your people, hear what they have to say. Uh, let them, uh, let them, uh, uh, let them be negative, let them be positive. Just give them the freedom to think for themselves and to uh, have the same passion I do. And uh, once you start something to see it grow. And if they don't have the passion I have, then they can't work for me because you mentioned passion a couple of times. You could have passion and not be passionate. I, I, uh, I have passion, but I'm very passionate. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do you, in terms of like, you know, mentoring, if, if you're working with young people today in today's climate, in today's world, um, are there certain things or principles or whatever that you focus on in terms of how you're building into young people? Well, uh, the, uh, you know, our uh, dialogue right now is the same dialogue I'll have with young people. Same dialogue. It, it's, it's uh, you know, all of these kids have, uh, have ideas, et cetera. And I tell them, you know, uh, what are you doing to, uh, to successfully execute those ideas? And that creates a dialogue. And I have that dialogue with them and uh, all based on my personal experiences and knowledge. And uh, so I talk to them really as a father uh, figure as well as a mentor. And, and what about failure? I mean, I, you haven't failed a lot if I don't, you know, but, but how do you deal with failure? What is the song? Uh, you uh, dust, you fall, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Uh, I have failed, sure, but I believe in myself. I believe that the, the failure was uh, something that could have been avoided. So I learned by that failure, and hopefully, uh, not make the same mistakes uh, the second time or the third time. And. Uh, you know, no, I have failed. I've lost a lot of money in uh, investing uh, in certain areas. I invested, for example, in a television network in Peru, uh, which uh, totally failed uh, because of politics uh, that I had no control over and because of the uh, economics of Peru. So I lost a lot of money in that investment. I had uh, uh, desires of using Peru uh, that uh, network in Peru uh, as a uh, uh, as a stepping stone to own two or three or four other 
networks in South America. But when I lost the money, I uh, decided that was not for me because it's difficult to run a business being uh, living in the United States and running it in a country which is pretty far away from you and is involved in the political world uh, that uh, in the economic world that has nothing to do with you and that you have no control over. So I learned the hard way, don't invest in situations like that that you can't control. Stubbing your toe, failing. I mean, you know, entrepreneurs are, I mean, this is the hardest thing I think in the world to do. To be, to be an entrepreneur and actually execute is really hard. I mean, it's, and, and I don't think it's for everyone, but, but, but what you're saying is if you, if you have an experience where you fail, that doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means you learn and you get back up and go forward. Dust yourself off. Yeah. Right. And start all over again. We're almost out of time, but 43 years of marriage for you. And I know you have kids and any, uh, you got any advice on marriage? Uh, marry the right woman. <laughs> Start there, right. Start there. Uh, I happen to have married up. Uh, <laughs> so have I, yeah. I married uh, uh, the most one of the most beautiful women in the world. She happens to be a Bond girl. And uh, she had the lead in Thunderball, which is the fourth James Bond film. Huh. And her name is Luciana Paluzzi and uh, has been voted as the number one Bond girl uh, out of the 22 Bond films. Wow. And, uh, and uh, she is uh, the queen. Uh, and if she was a male, she'd be the king. And uh, <laughs> she runs everything that I do and I'd be totally lost without her. So uh, we have an extraordinary marriage and uh, it'll be 43 years, October 28th. Oh, congratulations. Fantastic. This guy, man, when, when is the movie going to be made about you? Oh, yeah, but uh, I can't imagine who could play me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Well, hey, it, it, what, a, what a journey. $38 a week loading trucks to NASDAQ and then marrying a Bond girl. This The story is wonderful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Michael, thank you for coming on. It's great having you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time.